Good morning for everyone on the West Coast. Good afternoon uh, for everyone here on the East Coast. And welcome to today's webinar on Making the Move to BIM, presented by Lynn Allen, who we'll introduce here in a little bit. My name is Brandon Burkholder, and I'm an account executive here for Microsoft Resources, specifically working with New York City architecture firms. So for all my architecture firms out there today listening in, have any questions, any comments, looking at anything new, please do not hesitate to reach out to us and specifically myself at Microsoft Resources. Um, but before we begin today, I'd like to introduce Microsoft Resources and the services that we've provided for our clients for the last 30 years. We've been an Autodesk Platinum Partner for 25 years, and we understand the uh, challenges that clients are faced with today. And if you are, um, if we are your Autodesk partner, we thank you and are honored to assist you. Uh, if we are not your Autodesk partner, we would be honored to assist you. Uh, please let us know how we can help. You can certainly get in contact with myself, or if you want to shoot a quick note, info at microsoftresources.com. We serve firms in the Northeast region, and we have offices and training centers in New York, Boston, and Philadelphia, and we work exclusively with the AEC industries. Uh, we also have training, technical support, and consulting services from CAD and bid management to 3D printing services. As many of you are familiar, we have a lot of training uh, that we do here at Microsoft Resources, and uh, we have a schedule that you can check more out, microsoftresources.com slash training. To provide an overview, we work within BIM Essentials, BIM Advanced, CAD Essentials and Advanced, and we have some additional courses as well. So please feel free, microsoftresources.com slash training to learn more. Speaking of the AEC collection, just wanted to highlight uh, many of the individual products that you see here that are included in the AEC collection. So obviously understanding AutoCAD and Revit are two of the main uh, products that are being utilized by many of the people in the webinar today. Feel free to take a little bit more of a look at the AEC collection and um, the many other tools that firms are utilizing within it. Again, today's webinar, Making the Move to BIM. And inside this webinar, um, a few key points here that we are going to be learning or the objectives that we're going to be learning today. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Lynn Allen, who is an early CAD entrepreneur, uh, worked in corporate and collegiate level for 10 years before joining Autodesk. She is the face behind hundreds of software videos, including the series Tips and Tricks with Lynn Allen. She is also the author of three technical books focused on Autodesk software. Lynn has been a global driving force in moving 2D CAD users to digital prototyping and BIM. So without further ado, it's my honor to introduce global technology evangelist Lynn Allen. Lynn, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you for that great introduction and welcome everybody. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to join me today. And we're going to be, hey, talking all about making that great move over to BIM. So if you're joining us today, I assume that you're thinking about making the move to BIM or uh, you've been hearing about BIM or you maybe even started to make the move over to BIM. You maybe just want some tips on how to do that effectively. And we're going to cover all of that ground today. And I always like to kind of start off when I'm discussing this whole concept about making over making the move over to building information modeling by talking about this whole concept of disruption, uh, because as we've gone through our, you know, our CAD lives through our design lives, we have run into all of our, li our lives in general. We've run into this whole concept of disruption when it comes to technology and innovations. And disruption can be kind of an uncomfortable thing. It can lead to great things. Uh, it cannot. Sometimes it doesn't lead to great things. <laughs> but uh, when it does lead to great things, it is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And you and I, we've been through a few disruptive technologies and uh, hopefully came out better for it. I, I found this uh, definition on the Internet, so I know it must be true. A disruptive innovation is an innovation that helps create a new market and value network. 
and eventually disrupts an existing market and value network. See, that's where the opportunity comes in. Could happen over a few years or decades, displacing an earlier technology. And some of us might have even been around in the early days of AutoCAD. I certainly was around in, in not the earliest days of AutoCAD, but certainly some of the early days of AutoCAD. Uh, believe it or not, AutoCAD's been around now for 36 years. We were just celebrating the 35th birthday of AutoCAD. Now we're up to 36. If you can imagine a software program being around for that long, that's kind of hard to believe, and still so popular, still a very, very popular software program. And uh, AutoCAD, hello very, very, very disruptive. And uh, I certainly remember when AutoCAD, as, as mentioned in the early days of AutoCAD, how disruptive it was because back then everybody was drawing by hand, right? People were drawing on a piece of paper. And here, here comes this CAD program, this very disruptive, innovative technology. And now we're taking people from drawing on a piece of paper to taking their designs and drawing them in a computer. And it was a pretty crazy time. Now, I was actually an AutoCAD instructor and I uh, had a lot of very unhappy students, let me tell you. I had quite a few students who stood up in the middle of my classroom saying, this CAD is never gonna catch on. I could have drawn this 10 times by now. And I actually had students who left my class. Now, you know, maybe I wasn't a very good instructor, I don't know. But it was a very frustrating, very disruptive time. And uh, I, you know, I think we can both, all of us can agree that this whole CAD thing did catch on, especially when governments came along and started mandating that DWG was the format that you had to be dealing with if you were going to do any public sector projects. But eventually that whole CAD thing did catch on and it was embraced. And now none of us really question that, right? We don't really question whether or not that disruptive, innovative technology is gonna catch on. Okay, so now we're all really good at AutoCAD. We're great at CAD, yay CAD, we've embraced it. You don't really see too many people, uh, too many designers drafting by hand anymore. There's still some out there. And now here comes this land of BIM. What, what's up with that? Building information modeling comes along. We're all comfy cozy. And now this very disruptive technology comes along. This disruptive process comes along and uh, we're having to make a change again. And for some of us, it's been harder than for others. And we're gonna be talking about that today, building information modeling, all right? So now one of the things I mentioned to you before was that one of the reasons that DWG was finally assimilated, if you will, was because governments started mandating that DWG format. And we're seeing that also with BIM, we're seeing it all over the world. And that, you know, one of the, the countries that really put a stake in the ground was the UK when they said, hey, by the year 2016, if you were gonna do any public sector projects, you were gonna have to use BIM. At the time it was level two BIM. They absolutely mandated it, Europe followed, and all over the world, we're actually seeing a variety of government projects that are mandated, they have to have a certain level of BIM. And, and I've actually been traveling over the last year, uh, working with quite a few government agencies, and you know, we're seeing more and more government agencies in the US even that are also mandating BIM. So we're, you know, we're seeing more and more of this uh, countries, and companies that are pulling the way, making BIM an industry standard. Now, I'll be, I'm a, I'm really big into stats. I don't know if you are or not. And so I like, I don't want to just, you know, I don't like hearsay. I like facts and figures. So There's going to be a lot of facts and figures in my presentation. And I like to quote Dodge a lot. And Microsoft uh, has done quite a few webcasts and had a lot of few live presentations where they have Dodge come out. Uh, Steve Jones specifically, who I just love, who's done quite a few presentations, just completely facts and figures as it relates to BIM. So if you uh, are into facts and figures like me, I highly recommend that you watch some of their previous webcasts. This is, they're fascinating. So you can look up these smart market reports, they're called lots of facts and figures. I'm gonna be pulling some of that information into my presentation today. So if you see a fact or figure in here, it's probably as a result of a Dodge smart market report. So here's something that I grabbed from one of the smart market reports. So. BIM will make you more pro marketable and profitable. I absolutely believe that. And it, it, this is kind of a naysayer here. It's kind of a negative if you don't adopt it in that it's predicted that within the next two years, 50% of all requests for proposals, right, RFPs, in the AEC industry are going to require BIM. Okay, so guess what, right? If you don't establish a BIM expertise, 
you're going to have to win twice as many of those non-BIM RFPs just to maintain the same level of business that you have right now. All right, so that's a little scary. So the door, the, that, you know, the door is closing, the window is closing if you do not start to think about making the move over to BIM. So I don't want to scare you, but I, you know, I want you to be successful. So you got to start to think about it. Now, if you take a look at BIM adoption, it's going up, 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 up. You know, the, the, the trend is not going the other way. This is exactly what happened with CAD, right? So the BIM's going, it's, 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 getting, it's not going to go away. <laughs> So it's really up to you to decide when you're going to embrace BIM. It's not going to go away, I promise you. Here's some more. Uh, here's some more facts and figures. And occasionally you'll see McGraw Hill in here. So Dodge actually came in and they bought out all the rights to McGraw Hill. Same thing, Dodge. And these facts are a little behind. That's not uncommon in these uh, reports because by the time they gather the information, get all the stats together, and uh, publish the reports, it's not uncommon for them to be a couple of years behind, but I can tell you these numbers aren't going down. They're just going up, up, up. But you can see the percentage of the players using BIM on more than 60% of their projects. And I don't know where you are. Are you an architect? Are you, you know, one of the engineers or the contractors, the owners? But you can see once again that these numbers are just continuing to go up. So the writing's on the wall, I promise you. The AEC industry is moving to BIM. And we'll talk about some of the advantages as to why this is happening. And then the last part of the presentation, I'll be giving you some suggestions. I'm gonna give you a big pep talk as to why, um, how easy it's gonna be for you to do it, some suggestions on how to do it and why you're gonna like it so much, all right? Because there's a lot of good behind making the move to BIM. It's, you know, it's change. A lot of us don't like change. Don't move my cheese, right? But uh, you're going to ultimately be so happy once you make that move. So what the heck is BIM? Building information modeling. I'm sure you know that part. But it's a digital rep. Okay, so this is a big, long explanation that was put together by the National BIM Standard. I'm sure they had a bunch of people in a room probably arguing <laughs> over this particular definition. Um, it's uh, pretty wordy. I'll say it really fast. The digital representation of a of physical and functional characteristics of a facility, but it could be a bridge, could be a roadway, right? It's a shared knowledge resource for information about a facility, once again, or a roadway or a bridge, forming a reliable basis for decisions. I think that's really important. So you can make smart decisions during its life cycle, defined as existing from earliest conception all the way to demolition. So I like that part too, right? So as soon as you start to have a concept about whatever it is you're building, um, all the way to when whatever it is is no longer in use, it's completely demolished. I actually like the Autodesk definition better because it's short and sweet. <laughs> it's an intelligent model-based process that provides value across the life cycle of a project. I like that, that's easier, short and sweet. And I think the key word there is process, and I can't emphasize that enough, is that BIM is not a software, it is a process. You can't go down to the BIM store and buy yourself some BIM, all right? Now, there are some tools that lend themselves better to the BIM process, certainly more so than AutoCAD, and that's why you'll tell, people will tell you that you gotta get off AutoCAD if you're gonna make the move to BIM. Um, you can, there is some limited value in staying on AutoCAD, but it's really not gonna lend itself to the BIM process, and we'll talk about that. Tools such as Revit, for example, which is part of that AEC collection, uh, are definitely gonna lend themselves much better to the BIM process, all right? so. That's why you'll hear people say, no, you gotta move off of AutoCAD, you need to move to Revit. Okay. But just so you know, those are just tools for BIM. There's more to it than that. So what is a building information model? Well, let's talk about that. So it's a smart, intelligent model with intelligent objects. It could know all different types of things. It might know materials, it might know assembly procedures, how things are put together, it might have no specifications. The most important part of BIM is that I, the information aspect. It might know prices or manufacturers, and I think the key thing is it might know about relationships. That's important. If you put a window in a wall, it knows that that window is supposed to stay in that wall, and if you delete the window, it knows to heal itself, you know, and, and it knows about relationships between objects. This door needs to be four inches away from that corner. You know, it just, it's, 
it knows about relationships between objects. It's smart, 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 which I love. It's a 3D digital model, incidentally. Good luck doing that type of stuff inside of AutoCAD. You just are very limited in what you can do with AutoCAD. It's just not smart enough. And I love AutoCAD. If you know anything about me, <laughs> I'm an AutoCAD lover. I hate to be picking on AutoCAD. A 3D digital model is assembled in the same way a building is constructed. What? So AutoCAD doesn't do that either. You know, we draw lines, arcs, and circles. We throw some blocks in there. We don't pay attention to the way the building is constructed. Well, guess what? When you make the move to Revit, you're going to pay more attention to that. But I'll also say that if you know how a building is constructed, wow, your worth just went up exponentially. We'll talk about that later as well. And then it's a database of geometric information. The stuff that we can see, that's what we're used to with AutoCAD, the stuff we can see. But then there's all this information behind the scenes that we can't see that adds a great deal of value to our model. It's that eye again, that information aspect. So, And there's more to the building information model. These are just a few of the highlights, right? And then I just like this quote. If a picture is worth a thousand words, then a BIM model is worth a million. All right, so now on that note, I also want to point out that you will occasionally hear people get upset if you say BIM model, because technically that's redundant. That would be a building information model model, <laughs> or building information modeling model, whatever. So I make mistakes, I say that all the time, but people who are better than me do not make that mistake. So just something for you to think about. You might hear someone say that to you. So BIM requires cross-functional teams to work together. That's also something we're not used to with CAD. With CAD, like I do my job, I throw it over the fence to the next team. I don't even talk, I don't talk to them anymore, unless I have to. So with BIM, though, these teams need to work together. They need to make sure that the model works together. You need to, you know, you run into things like clash detection and things like that. And uh, it's a very different concept, but ultimately you end up with this great robust model that when you get to the construction phase, hopefully is all good to go. And uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this chart. This chart has been around forever. It's called the sawtooth chart. I've seen it in so many different, uh, different forms, but it's still super valid. So I hate to not show it. If, so it used to be, right, the designer would draw their CAD drawing and they get it all done. They'd throw that over the fence to the you know myriad of different engineers. And lots of times the engineer would start all over again with a new CAD drawing from scratch. Again, maybe they take some of the information from the original CAD drawing, but lots of times they just start all over because nothing's ever good enough for them, right? They start all over again and then they would get do their job. And then they throw it over the fence to the contractor who would often start all over again and then eventually would make it over to the owners and the facilities managers and they would start all over again with their own CAD drawings. What a waste of time. Everybody is, you know, basically reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. What a waste of time. All that data is being thrown away over and over and over again. Well, in the perfect world, everybody's building on the same model. I throw it over to the fence, the engineer, he takes my model and he works from my model. He goes from there and so on and so forth. And the contractor works from the, all of the, whatever the engineers have done with that model, right? And he goes from there and then we hand a beautiful model over to the owner when it's all said and done and the facility managers can come in and work from there. And we're not continually starting all over. And we have this beautiful, fabulous, smart model when we're all said and done. See, that would be fantastic, right? So what else do we get with BIM? Fewer construction change orders. Why? Because we have that great model that's so intelligent. We've been able to do all kinds of things, all kinds of checking, like you'll see in a second, clash detection and things like that, right? And we have a reduced number of RFIs. Now, it's estimated that 30% of construction dollars are wasted every year. That's a lot of money. Guess who cares about that? Owners care about that. They want to save money. They would be really happy if they didn't have to throw that money out the window every, with all of their projects, right? So huge advantage there. You can see owners are really pushing for BIM. And this here's some stats for you. This actually is uh, not um, by Dodge. This is McKinsey, but there's a 220 million uh, construction workers out in the field right now. And it's estimated that there's a 40% waste of materials just because we don't have our acts together. We aren't planning properly. That's a lot of waste of materials. That's not very green at all. That's horrible. And that 80% of owners just know that there's going to be an added cost. So whatever you come in and you say, this is how much it's going to cost to design or build this building, to build this building, they know 80% of them know it's going to be, it's going to cost more. 
And at 20, there's an average schedule overrun of 20%. All right, once again, I know it's gonna cost more and it's gonna take longer. And that there's an average cost increase of three to 5%. Geez, I, I feel like that's low. Personally, I feel like that's low, but nevertheless, everything's over budget. Everything is overrun, takes longer. It's just not a good system. We can't continue to be successful in this type of system. And then I just like this picture. <laughs> so see if you're, wake up, look at the screen in case you fell asleep or you're doing your email, because I just find this amusing. I love the little dinghy that says original contract down in the lower right hand corner. And then you'll see it says change order is the great big huge yacht. <laughs> We gotta stop that. We can't be successful if we continue to stay away from the world of BIM and plan ahead, right? We just cannot be successful. All right, so when you have BIM, you have that great intelligent model, you can eliminate clashes before they happen. You can see, you can run clash detection. We have great BIM 360 pro products that can take a look at your model and find clashes before they get to the construction phase. There should, by the time it gets to the construction phase, everything should be completely worked out. Besides, it's extremely expensive to find clashes at the construction site. You know that, I know that. You don't wanna find them out there, you wanna find them out ahead of time. What else saves money? Prefabrication saves money, right? And uh, the more prefabrication you can do, but once again, less money you're gonna be spending. And here's some facts, that's a Dodge fact. 73% of contractors forecast that model-driven prefabrication will improve their returns. That's not rocket science, that's just common sense. Then I'm all about sustainability. There's so much construction waste, as I mentioned to you before. Um, we gotta fix that, that's not good. That's just bad, bad, bad. You can also do very cool things like energy analysis. You can make sure you're designing buildings that are gonna be nice and green, LEED certified. You can test them before you ever build them. You can do structural analysis, make sure they're sound buildings. You can do environmental analyses. You can do uh, CFD, computational fluid <laughs> dynamics. I just like to say that because it makes me sound so incredibly intelligent. <laughs> but you can do all types of, you can test your HVAC system. I think I have a little video here. You can test that out ahead of time. You can see, is that air conditioner gonna work right? You can do all different types of analyses on your, in this case, I'll say buildings, but it could be, once again, your bridge, uh, your roadway, whatever the scenario is, ahead of time that you just can't do with the flat CAD drawing. I'm sorry, you can't. Yay, Bim. You can also do sequencing. So you can you know, plan ahead. This is a scenario, this is a company called Ica out of Mexico City where they were building this elevated highway. And you know you don't want to find out that the cranes don't fit when you, it's when it's too late. They had a very tight schedule. They could only work in the middle of the night from like one to four in the morning to put in this elevated highway. They could risk slowing down traffic during the day, but they were able to make sure all of these cranes fit perfectly. You can see that there, a little 4D, and they were able to do cost. You can do cost estimation as well when you get into the BIM process. How much is everything going to cost? You can itemize everything, you can do all that great 4D and 5D. I sold you yet? I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> For a limited time only. And then, you know, one of the uh, one of the great things that really got people into BIM early on to begin with was literally just the communication aspect of it. Uh, it's so much easier when you can see things in 3D, right? When you can visualize the goal. And here on the left-hand side, this is a rendering of a, of a water treatment plant. And on the, the before construction on the right is actually what happens, the actual photograph of that same water treatment plant. How much easier is it to build when you know what the goal looks like? The communication aspect, whether you're communicating to construction uh, workers or you're communicating to someone you're trying to sell a pro uh, you know, your project to. Um, here's an, I love this example. This is a Starbucks in Japan where they designed a Revit model and then using a, a fabulous product called a Revit Live, they were able to take that model and it's a super simple product as well, which I absolutely love. They were able just to drop this Revit model in and then it animates it for you in such a way that you can just like, well, it doesn't really animate it, but you can walk through it. And imagine a building owner saying, this is what your Starbucks is gonna look like and letting him walk through it and truly experience it. I'm telling you, how could you not win this? You know, How could you not get this proposal? This is so amazing. Here you can see he's got the controllers there. And I think he, he actually makes a lot to ease a show off. 
But this is pretty amazing technology. This is all something you could do. It looks really complicated and really hard, but it's not. And it's super impressive. I've, I've done it. <laughs> if I can do it, you can do it. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. So being able to communicate with all members of the team, being able to communicate proposals to win proposals, being able to communicate with the builders, it's super, um, such an advantage when it comes to BIM. And then it, the increased certainty as well, being able to punch holes ahead of time. You know, when uh, when here you've got this on the ground as opposed to up when it's dangerous, when it's, you know, up in the air after it's already been, you know, all the sheet rocks already been put up. You want to be able to do all this ahead of time, but you know exactly where all the systems are going to go. So you can make these decisions ahead of time and you can feel confident in where you're going to, once again, in this situation, punch all those holes. Pretty impressive technology. You can make educated decisions ahead of time. I just like throwing this in. The McLeamy curve, named after McLeamy. <laughs> so... If you just kind of take a look at this chart, you can go from left to right. See in the lower left-hand corner, it says little. If I had a, you know, if I was in front of you, I'd be pointing to it. But, you know, the very early phases, the cost of design changes are little, right? And in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see it says heaps. That's the ability to impact the project. As we go from left to right, design changes cost a lot more. And the ability to impact the project also goes down dramatically. And in the old way we used to do things, the typical way we used to do things, it would cost us a lot to change the design, but we had little impact on the project. But with the IPD, Integrated Product Delivery, right, and especially adding in BIM, I'll throw some BIM on there, we have the ability to save a lot of money and also impact the project a lot so much earlier. And that is the goal. You know, not do things the way we've been doing it for years and years. We're wasting a lot of money. We don't have our acts together but truly changing the entire AEC industry. And that's the goal here. Making smarter decisions, being able to save lots of money, not wasting materials, being safer as well. There's so many, so many reasons to truly embrace BIM. Now you know the McLeamy curve. Some of you already know the McLeamy curve. But now if you're out to dinner and someone says, hey, how about that McLeamy curve? Now you know what we're they're talking about. <laughs> All right, so this is for you CAD people. This is the best part. Even if nothing else made sense to you. This if you just get down to the nitty gritty. Nobody likes the boring part of AutoCAD, the tedium, right? Having to do elevations and section views and blah, 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 all those details. All that stuff, all the drawing views, the schedules and everything are, are generated automatically from the model. So uh, you'll actually see you spend more time designing the model up front, but all those construction documents are just pulled right off the model. They're just pulled right off the model. They're a piece of cake. You don't spend as much time on construction documents as you used to, not at all. And guess what? If you need to change your design, not that your designs ever change, they probably never do, but let's say they do, all of those construction documents update automatically. What? Can't make that up. It's fabulous. It's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. You need to change a um, an elevation. Just move the elevation line, the little section line or section views. Just move the section line around. There's just it's so easy to make changes. You don't need to keep track of all the details and all the numbering and everything. All that gets automated automatically updated for you. You don't have to go through every single page and update everything. It's a beautiful thing. Let me tell you. You got the one model. You just change the one model. Everything automatically updates. It is fabulous. All right, more facts and figures, Lynn. More facts and figures. So this is an example of one of the smart market reports. There's a bunch of them out there. You'd pick the one that makes the most sense for you. This is just one. This happens to be a BIM for owners. You pick the one that matters to you. Uh, there's civil, there's construction, uh, you name it. They're out there and all different geos as well. So here's just some BIM adoption facts. Nearly half of the civil firms are using BIM. 70% of architects have adopted BIM. 74% of contractors have adopted BIM. 67% of structural MEP report participating in BIM projects. Contractors see the highest ROI with 71%. And here's a chart also of um, the biggest advantages that are being seen with BIM. 70%, that's the highest one, fewer RFIs during construction. 
You can see the next one down, reduced material waste, 54%, shortened schedules, 51%, lower final construction cost at 48%, and fewer safety incidents. That's huge, right? We want to be safe. For those of you who are contractors, I'm not going to go through this, but you can see if you want to look up the smart market report for contractors, you can see there's a, all the advantages that contractors say as a result of BIM. And I am going to talk about this, though. I like this. So this is just a direct comparison. This is by one of my friends, David Cohn, and he is an AutoCAD guy, by the way. He's not a Revit guy. He has been using AutoCAD longer than me. He started like with 1.1. He's, he's the pro. And he has been using Auto. He's written a bunch of AutoCAD books, and he's all about AutoCAD. And, and he knows Revit as well, but not nearly as well as he knows AutoCAD. So he decided to literally compare the difference. And he did this project. So it was 10 sheets of construction documents. They were originally just traditional board drafting. It was a two-story hospital edition. And then he did this CAD and BIM study where he was going to recreate both, um, both using both programs to do these 10 sheets of construction documents. All right. So hopefully you can see this on your screen. Hopefully you have a bigger monitor than I do. I'm just using a laptop. It's kind of small. So but I want you to see the floor plans. He didn't save any time really in Revit. That's about the same. The original upfront floor plans, yeah, I didn't save any time. But where you start to save time is like with the elevations. Look how tiny the line is for elevations in Revit. And the reflected ceiling plans, the building sections. You can see all of that takes a lot more time to do in AutoCAD because you have to draw those all manually. But inside of Revit, you all just pull those right off. This was a few releases ago, but it doesn't matter. Because the point is, probably even shorter now, but the point is that um, the initial drawing, about the same, but then you're pulling all those complicated, tedious things off, schedules and things like that off very, very quickly. And that is cool. <laughs> We'd like to save time. If you get paid by the hour, do not buy Revit. Okay. And you don't need to jump into BIM with both feet to begin with. I think this is important too. Um, you will see the largest return on investment if you do. Um, but you don't have to take your clutches off of your AutoCAD to begin with until you feel comfortable. Um, but uh, you will eventually, you should eventually <laughs> release AutoCAD. You will, you will, but you know, don't feel like you have to totally jump in with both feet. But I'm going to show you this. This is also from Dodge that until you totally do jump in with both feet, you are not going to see the highest return on engagement. This is a little bit of a difficult chart to understand. Um, but if you take a look on the left-hand side, there's a low BIM engagement. Do you see that? It says 35%. So this is, if you don't really jump in, let's say you still have a, a foot in the water and a foot out of BIM, um, you will see the, RO, the ROI is that little blue section on the top a really good ROI. You only get like an 11% ROI if you've still got a good solid foot in your AutoCAD water. <laughs> or if you go all the way to the right, very high BIM engagement where you really did jump in with both feet, you can see that that blue section, that 50% is much higher. So until you are willing to jump in with both feet and just go for it, you're not going to really see the highest return on investment. So it's hard to let go, but when you finally do, that's when you're going to really reap the highest rewards. Okay, so let's say I convinced you. Now what? So there's some realities, right? So you're not going to move to BIM overnight. It's going to take a while. You're probably going to have to have better hardware because you're not dealing with little DWG files anymore. Now you're dealing with these serious models. you got a lot of information in there. You, you probably going to have a bunch of different disciplines dealing with the same model. You're going to have, you're going to want good hardware or you're going to get frustrated and you're definitely going to spend more time on your models at first, right? There's going to be an adjustment. Okay. And BIM is more front loaded than CAD. Hmm. That's interesting. So what I mean by that is that you saw that in that chart with David Cohn, with David, the David Cohn comparison, uh, you're going to spend more time, working on your model in the beginning, doing the whole floor plans and everything is going to take a little bit more time. You're going to really reap the benefits when you create those construction documents, all the elevations and the schedules and the, and the um, sex views and the details and blah, blah, blah. All that stuff is very fast. But the initial part in the beginning is going to take a little bit longer. 
So you gotta remember it's front loaded and you're gonna be frustrated. You're gonna go, oh, this is taking too long. Why is this part taking so long? You just have to hang in there so you get to reap the rewards at the end. You have to be patient. And there's that whole change in process, right? There's more emphasis and time placed on early design, as I mentioned. I already mentioned the second bullet. Um, and this model is assembled in the same way a building is constructed, which, as I mentioned, is very different than what we're used to, also different. And that those extended design teams, they butt in earlier. <laughs> they become involved earlier. They might be looking over your shoulder. They might just be looking over your shoulders. Oh, wait. I want... Oh. And then also, you need to have more standards and controls in place. So, I mean, I like to believe that you're organized with your CAD drawings and you have some good standards and controls in place, some good template files and things like that. Uh, but when it comes to BIM, you need to have really good standards and controls in place. You need to have super good templates. You need to have someone who reels everybody in, make sure everybody's following the same basic guidelines. And you need to have a good BIM execution plan. And that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother day. And I did just put some suggestions on here. Everybody loves the Penn State execution plan. <laughs> so I put that on there. Penn State's got it going. There's actually a picture of the Penn State execution plan. If you're interested in taking a look at an execution plan, AIA has them. The BIM forum ha is working on an execution plan. Autodesk has them. Uh, Microsoft can, of course, help you out with this BIM execution plan. Uh, but you want to have a good plan in place for how you are going to do your BIM planning. All right. Don't just go crazy. <laughs> Got to have a plan. If you're in a planner. BIM's going to go badly. You can quote me on that. And here's some Revit facts. Let's decide that you're going to go the Revit. Let's say if you're civil, you're going to say with civil 3D. All right. You guys got it easy. You say with civil 3D based on AutoCAD. But for those of you who are, uh, let's say you're um, the A or the E part, you're going to probably be based on one of those Revit aspects, one of the Revit products. So Revit's easier to learn than AutoCAD. And I'm going to tell you, if you can use AutoCAD, you can totally learn Revit. AutoCAD is one of the hardest software products in the world to learn. Did you know that? It has so many different ways of doing anything. It is not that friendly. And I don't know if you remember when you learned AutoCAD, but it was it's hard to learn. It is not an easy product to learn. So I, I always kind of chuckle when people are like, oh, I don't know if I can learn Revit. I'm like, really? Because you learned AutoCAD. You are a genius. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can learn Revit. And if you're already using AutoCAD architecture, some of you out there, you can totally learn Revit because it's you're on the same track. It's much easier to go from AutoCAD architecture to Revit, by the way. So if for some reason you're not ready to make the move to Revit and you have AutoCAD, uh, especially now with this new one AutoCAD, you have access to AutoCAD architecture absolutely free. Do yourself a favor and start to use AutoCAD architecture. That will at least be a baby step on the way to BIM. All right. Promise me you'll do that. Uh, or whatever the whatever your discipline is, download that tool set of AutoCAD if you're not willing to make the full on move. All right, that's what I would suggest. And you know, Revit's based on newer technology. It's not 36 years old, people. So it's easier to use. It's, it has a lot of friendlier things in it. And it was designed specifically for AEC. AutoCAD was designed all things for all people. It was designed for manufacturing. It was designed for interior decorators. It was designed for, oh my gosh, all different types of disciplines. Revit specifically for AEC. All right. It's lines, arcs, and, you know, AutoCAD is lines, arcs, and circles. Whereas Revit is walls and doors and windows, and, you know, you name it. And uh, I did mention this before, you know, change it once, change it everywhere, which is my favorite part. One thing that will drive you crazy, you're used to working with a whole bunch of TWGs, and you're going to be working with one file. That's going to drive you crazy. It's, it's different. It's definitely different. It could be one pretty big file as well. But there's a lot less TDM. You don't have to do any more of that horrible, awful polylining that nobody likes. And if you have a fear of 3D, which a lot of people do because the 3D in AutoCAD is hard, you are not going to have that three, fear of 3D in, um, you shouldn't have that in Revit because a lot of it's generated automatically and it's just friendly. It's a lot friendlier. The, the 3D in AutoCAD, definitely not friendly. I don't like the 3D in AutoCAD. Um, and then after the learning curve, you're going to get your jobs done faster. Once again, get paid by the hour. Do not adopt Revit. No, you'll just get another job. You'll get more jobs. 
And what about all your auto, AutoCAD hard work? People are like, oh, I did all this stuff in AutoCAD. I can't bear to throw it away. What about all my AutoCAD knowledge? Okay, so you can take DWG files into Revit. Maybe you want your details to go into Revit. Nothing wrong with that. A lot of people do it. You can do that. And you can bring your floor plans. If you have a floor plan you want to take it, that you've already done in AutoCAD, you can take that into Revit and work with it from there if you want to. You can do that. And the links, a link is dynamic like an XREF. You can, you can do it that way. I tell you, after you get to know Revit, you won't do that because you're going to be so good at it. But you can. And I'll tell you this too. Once somebody actually converts over to Revit, then they ever rarely... So, I mean, it's almost not existent that they ever want to go back. Not if they really learn it. If you really learn how to use Revit, you will never want to go back. And I always, I do a lot of these presentations live, and I uh, there's always a few Revit users in the crowd when I'm doing the presentations, and I'll ask them, I'll, I'll ask them live, because this never goes wrong, would you ever go back to using AutoCAD? They're like my best conversion factors, you know, and they'll say, no, never, they're adamant. There's no way you could get them to go back to AutoCAD. And that to me is the best selling point. And you guys all know the Revit, you have Revit friends who tell you they would never go back to AutoCAD. So I know you've got them. So I'm really big into training. Hey, you saw all those classes that Microsoft has and they are great trainers. I know them. They're really, really good. They're great presenters. They're, they're well-known presenters at AU. They're great. They're engaging training. It's all about training. And I'm big into getting out of your work and going over to take training. Um, leave your phone behind. Leave your, you know, don't, if, uh, get out and go take training. I can't emphasize that enough. Hands-on training. And I'm from the training industry, too. So I know that of which I speak. And timing is important. So if you don't go take training, only to go back to the office and not use the product for six months because you've just wasted your time. Make sure that you plan it so that you take the training and you're able to go back to work and actually use the training that you just took. All right, but definitely take as much training as you can convince your company to give you. I can't emphasize that enough. And then you want to start with a really low stress, stress project, okay? You know, you're not going to start with the, the World Trade Center, <laughs> even though... I know some who I know someone who did that, but um, yeah, very low stress project. Maybe something that you're familiar, you know, something you're familiar with, something you've done a million times in AutoCAD that you know the basics. Um, something that where you have time because it's going to take you extra time to do this project, not something that has to be out the door in a very very short window. Uh, I mean, I've <clears throat> excuse me, I've heard all different types of recommendations on the type of pro type of projects. Like I've heard new steel frame buildings. I've heard uh, not renovations, I've heard renovations, I've heard consistent column grids and regular floor plans, I've heard it all. Uh, uh, but um, nevertheless, you know, uh, Kate Morkle has a couple of, Kate, if you wanna remember that name, Kate Morkle, Kate Morkle. She has a couple of great articles out there that she's written on what types of projects to start with if you're interested. You can, you can send me an email and I will tell you where you can find that. And then it's really important that upper management is, checking the time, doing good. Upper management needs to be supportive and very patient because the, as you make the move to BIM, it's going to take time. Once you get there, once you get it all figured out, you're going to get it all done faster, but until there's going to be a learning curve, right, with anything. And I do think that ASAP is definitely poisonous. It's just going to stress everybody out and things are going to go badly. I've seen it. I've definitely seen it happen. But the results are fabulous. When, when a well-trained workforce, when everything is done, your projects will get done faster. You'll have intelligent 3D models that can be used throughout the entire life cycle of the building. You'll have all those great results that I talked about earlier. And it's, you know, it's going to be a wonderful, beautiful thing. The world will be beautiful. The sun will be shining. So what do you do with the rebels? Because you will have rebels. You'll have the AutoCAD strongholds. Maybe I'm talking to some of you out there. So AutoCAD's still part of the BIM process. There are still some limited reasons why you're going to want to have some AutoCAD users out there, depending on how big your office is. Um, well, first of, all, first of all, once you get some people who move to Revit, they won't want to even touch AutoCAD anymore. And they'll forget all their AutoCAD skills. Uh, so there's still reason to have at least one guy or two, depending on how big your office is, who will still pull up AutoCAD. And there's some situations where if you're just making some modifications, you're not going to start over with a whole new model if you're just going to make some modifications to some drawings, right? So there still is some validity in keeping the AutoCAD around and, and still making some modifications to drawings. So you still need to have that expertise. 
but just realize that in the perfect world, right, once again, people are really shifting over to that AEC collection and shifting over to using the more advanced products in the BIM process. And I'll tell you, once you make the move, you're gonna open more doors, you'll have opportunity to win more, more proposals and make more money. And then I'm also gonna say this for you. If you learn BIM, you learn these other products, you are gonna be more valuable. And if I was working at a company and they said, hey, we wanna make the move to BIM, and we're gonna teach you a new software product, I would be all over it. I'd be like, okay, yeah, where do I start? Because I know that ultimately I, as an individual, will be worth more and I will make more money. So don't, don't be a naysayer, don't say no, open your minds and start to think about what your future is gonna look like and how you will be more valuable. That's, I highly, highly, highly recommend that. Something for you to think about. And uh, in the, I have a good friend that I do a lot of classes with, his name is Steven Shell. And he's really well known in the industry. And he always makes, in his classes, he always says, Revit makes you giggle. And he probably doesn't sound like he's a very uh, sophisticated presenter, but he is world renowned and he has won so many awards for his speaking. And I'll tell you why that line makes sense because it, it, the point is that it's a fun program to use. Once you embrace it, once you learn it, it actually is a fun program to use and it will bring a little bit of fun into your job. And there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. I think that uh, our jobs are hard and we're doing them all day long and a lot of us spend so much time on a software product. Why not have a software product that's enjoyable? And I bet you AutoCAD doesn't make you giggle anymore. <laughs> it's probably just tedious and frustrating. So I, I'm, gonna th I'm just gonna throw that out there. I don't usually say that, but um, something for you to think about. It's a happy product. So what else? Oh, I was, so I have this, adding BIM to your resume will make you more valuable. And then I have this, especially if you know how to model it the way you build it. I have a lot of people when I do these presentations that stress about all of these people coming out of college that are competing with them in the industry. And I say, are you kidding me? Because guess what? They don't know how to build buildings. And a lot of you that are listening to me right now know how to build buildings. And you have a total leg up on all these people. So as long as you are willing to open your minds a little bit and learn this software, you, man, you can conquer this. You've got this. You are way ahead of everybody when it comes to BIM because you have that knowledge. And that's something that nobody coming out of college, they're not going to know that. You're going to be way ahead of everybody else. You're going to be valuable. It's a pep talk. <laughs> so, And then you get to think design, not CAD. That goes with that same comment. It's just more enjoyable, more fulfilling experience. So making the move to BIM is the same is the right decision, just like making the move to CAD was 30 years ago, for sure. It is, it is. And I just left you with a couple of comments. Um, I talk a lot about change, embracing change, and uh, how it can be really uncomfortable, just like that disruption I was talking about before. And But the most dangerous phase that often we run into, especially for those of us who've been in the same business for a long time, is this, we've always done it this way and we really need to be open-minded and we really, really need to move forward. And then I just think this is funny because I think we can all relate to this. What if we don't change it at all and something magical happens? That's just what we wish, but we have to learn to embrace change and move forward. And then we're often surprised when we actually enjoy that change.